Sometimes life is hard. It's difficult to solve some problems in life. Sometimes you get, you get close, but not all the way. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just take and snap our fingers and solve our problems just like that? Wouldn't that be nice? Unfortunately, not all of us can do that. And those of us who can uh, exercise a little trickery. Many things in life are hard. Things may be unpleasant. We want more and better, and we don't want to take the time or trouble required if we think we can find an easier way to do something. Why ask for help or wait for an answer when we can bypass all that and get what we want? You ever driven down I-75 or any of the major roads in the area? People don't want to wait for traffic or obey all those traffic laws to get themselves somewhere. They'd rather take the easy way. They'll weave in and out of the lanes, turn signals, ah, too much trouble. So that's the easy way to get through traffic. Unfortunately, there could be consequences such as a ticket or an accident, or a fatality. Got a test in school, no time to study, at least not and do all the other stuff you want to do. Cheat. Go ahead. Get some crib notes. Write the answers on your hand or on the book binder in your, on your desk. No big deal. Of course, you end up not learning all that good stuff you could have learned if you'd studied. And, of course, if you get caught, you might get an F for the class or even kicked out of school. Yet we still try to find the easy way. Christ told us that the road to destruction is wide and easy, but the gate to life is narrow and the road difficult. Don't believe him? Two big hits of the 1970s were Highway to Hell by ACDC and Stairway to Heaven by Led Zeppelin. Just look at those songs. The way to hell, a highway. The way to heaven, a little itty-bitty stairway. Even that shows you how much easier one is than the other. Of course, Jesus wasn't talking about our earthly life being easier or harder. Jesus was talking about having a life pleasing to God bringing us closer to him. We can't say something or do something that will make this miracle happen. Some people think you can do good deeds and you will get into heaven. If you only say your prayers, you'll be saved. If you come to church every Sunday or if you put something in the collection box. But we can't be saved by doing good deeds. That would be too easy. The word that's translated in our modern English Bible as saved can also be translated as rescued or healed. Remember when Jesus said to the woman who touched the edge of his cloak or to the man who was blind, your faith has healed you. They have been healed or saved by their faith. We only have a chance at salvation because Jesus died for us and we only have that chance if we understand that we aren't worthy of it and aren't able to buy our way into heaven. In his letter to the Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says, you are saved by God's grace because of your faith. This salvation is God's gift. It's not something you possessed. It's not something you did that you can be proud of. There is no easy route we can take. It's all up to God. We just have to follow his path of redemption. But how do we find that? In John 10, verse 9, Jesus says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. It's pretty clear then that Jesus is a path we must follow. And Jesus doesn't require a lot of us, only that we love God and love our neighbor as Jesus loved us. Sounds simple, but it's not. If we truly loved each other, 
there wouldn't be any theft or deceit or fighting or murder. If we truly loved each other, we wouldn't have people trying to get into our borders and keeping them away. We'd let them in. But if we truly loved each other, there would be no violence or starvation in their country to make them want to come here. If we truly loved each other, our leaders on both parties wouldn't have to worry about coming to a a default in our economy or a shutdown of our government because leaders of both parties would want to do what was best for the people rather than what was best for their political aspirations. We give up our shirt because we knew that our neighbor would give up their shirt if we needed it. So why doesn't that happen now? Why can't we just follow Jesus? An old Cold War story tells of the communist who was telling a visitor about how communism worked. A visitor said, so if you have two tractors and I need one to plow my fields, you'd give me one of those? Yes, comrade. So if you had two cows and I needed one of them to feed my family, you'd give me one of them? Again, yes, comrade. So if you had two hats and my head was cold, you'd give me one of them? Well, no, comrade. No, asked the visitor, why not? The communist said, well, I have two hats. <clears throat> We're happy to give what we can to others if we have it, but not if it takes something from us. We're happy to say that we'll, we will love our neighbor as Christ loved us until it actually comes down to doing something to show that. Then we take the easy way. We refer to the legal statutes and say we don't have to help you. We make excuses of why we can't or won't act. We pass the problem on to others to solve, since solving it may be hard or may make us do something we really don't want to do. That's the easy way. The hard way is to find out how we can help what we can do to rescue or heal our neighbor, even if it inconveniences you, even if it's not what we want to do. The easy way is turning our backs, ignoring the pain of others, not getting involved. The hard way is getting involved, lending a hand, perhaps making a phone call, or maybe sometimes just listening. How do we know what to do? Well, we have a great collection of 66 books all in one binder, which gives us ideas and examples. They tell us about others we can learn from, the prophets, Moses, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Daniel, Jacob, Joshua, and even the big guy himself, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. He was a prophet. Many people think that a prophet is someone who tells the future, like a a medium or a fortune teller. Actually, according to dictionary.com, a prophet is someone who speaks on behalf of God. Yes, many of the prophets of the Bible did talk about the future. They told of what God would do if people now didn't change what they did. But Jesus also talked about God and what God wanted, and how we could reconnect with God. He definitely spoke for God, because he was God. A pastor brings his or her congregation to God, taking them on a path to connection. As part of this, they need to pass on the word of God so that their congregations will understand both the path and the journey. On the other hand, a prophet isn't required to help you get there. They are just there to tell you what God wants you to do or what he's planning to do. They are divinely gifted to tell you the truth. People want to be saved, to be assured of life beyond this earthly one, and they'll listen to anyone who tell them what they need to know or, unfortunately, what they want to know. So how do you know if a prophet is real? And that's why Jesus warned us to watch out for false prophets. All prophets say they are speaking for God. That's what 
makes them a prophet. But unfortunately, those who are not truly speaking for God say the same thing. They will present themselves as holy and divine, blessed by God to speak on his behalf. But they will actually be speaking for themselves, for their own feelings. They will come to you dressed as sheep, but inside they are vicious wolves. We often see people on TV or in other churches telling us what God wants us to do. Their service has great production value, beautiful music and singing. The speaker is a strong, vibrant personality, and they seem to say what we expect a true prophet to say. God is watching, and he's upset with us. The evils of man will destroy the earth. All certainly sound like the old prophets of the Old Testament. But you know, I've never read in the Bible where the old prophet said, just give me 20 shekels and I shall pray for you. Or give me 10 pieces of silver and I will send you a piece of wood from the Holy Land that has been prayed over by one of my disciples. And certainly not, God wants me to have this luxurious tent and this 20 camel caravan and these beautiful and exquisite robes and sandals so that I may do his bidding. These people who say they are speaking for God seem to imply that they are speaking in his name and on his behalf. But are they the true prophets? Or are they the false prophets that Jesus warned us about? How do we know? Actually, Jesus gave us some insight into that. He knows we will be tempted by false prophets. In Matthew 10, verses 16, he says, Behold, I'm sending you as sheep among wolves. Therefore, be wise as snakes, but innocent as lambs. He wants us to be wary, to be shrewd in how we accept things that others might say or do. At the same time, we must maintain our innocence. For if we become too hard-hearted, we may miss what we are looking for. So my take on this is that Christ wants us to be careful, but not to the point of refusing to see the truth that is out there. So how do we know whom to follow or whom to listen to? This is why Jesus continues in the Sermon on the Mount, you will know them by their fruit. Good trees have good fruit. Bad trees have bad fruit. So this means that if the person who wants to listen to them does good things, then they are good and they are truly prophets, correct? Well, not really. Galatians chapter 5 explains the fruits a bit better. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are traits, not deeds. A bad person may do good deeds. It's often a characteristic of con men to do good deeds first, to get others to trust them. They try to gain your confidence. This is where the term con man comes from. But having good fruits goes so much deeper. Within the person's being, they must have love. They must seek peace and find joy. They must desire to practice patience, kindness, and goodness. And in all things, they must be faithful, gentleness, gentle, and exercise self-control. The so-called religious leader to, who asks for luxury jets and yachts and dines like a king, isn't practicing self-control. A person who salts his or her congregation with people to be healed when the evangelist touches them isn't practicing faithfulness. Those who preach anger and hatred towards others certainly aren't seeking peace or showing love. They are the wolves who are putting on the outside garments of sheep make us believe they are the true prophets of God. In Romans chapter 16, Paul wrote, Brothers and sisters, I urge you to watch out 
for people who create divisions and problems against the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. People like that aren't serving the Lord. They are serving their own feelings. They deceive the hearts of innocent people with a smooth talk and flattery. It doesn't matter how famous they are on TV or in the public or how respected they are from others. They may fool some people for a while. Remember that famous quote from Abraham Lincoln, you can fool some of the people all of the time and all of the people some of the time. They cannot feel all of the people all of the time. So before you allow yourself to be influenced by those who say they speak for God, take a little time to ask yourself some questions. How does what they say differ from what you've learned and what you hold in your heart? Does it reflect not just what the words of the Bible say, but what the words of Jesus Christ say? In many places within the New Testament, Christ told us the words we sometimes have learned from Scripture don't really reflect what God wants us to do. When the crowd wanted to stone the sinner to death, as was the law, Jesus said, let the first among you without sin cast the first stone. When the issue about what the law said about the foods we could or couldn't eat, Jesus said, the things we put in our mouths do not defile us. It's the things that come out of our mouths. When he was accused of helping someone on the Sabbath in violation of the laws, Jesus replied that the Sabbath was made for man and helping another was more important. How do the things these so-called prophets say compare to what Jesus has taught us about kindness, forgiveness, and love? Think and pray and ask God for guidance first. You'll be hearing soon about a new ministry in this church to help people avoid being deceived by online, over the phone, or even in-person scammers, hoping to gain your trust and take away your security. It's not just prophets who can be false. Be looking at the newsletter and the bulletins for more information in the near future. Behold, Christ said, I'm sending you as sheep among wolves. Therefore, be wise as snakes and innocent as doves. Keep your faith. Keep your generosity. Keep your love for others. But know that you must be wise and willing to ask questions. Don't let yourself be rushed into a decision. And be willing to ask for help, whether to a friend, a family member, your pastor, or the Bible. Pray. Look to see if what's being told you is the easy way to save yourself. Condemning others, judging those who are different, may make you fit in with the so-called prophets or religious leaders. Doing some good deeds while keeping anger, hatred, or greed in your heart may be seen by others as Christian actions, but God knows the true fruits of his children A scripture today says that a tree that doesn't produce fruit will be thrown into the fire. But a tree that is only withered can be brought back to life through watering and being fed with what it needs. Until it is unable to bear any fruit, there is still hope. Let the living waters of Jesus Christ refresh our souls and renew our spirits. Let the words and teaching of our Lord feed us and nourish us. Let the fruits of the Spirit grow inside us and make us stronger. May we look for that narrow, difficult path and choose to make our way back to God. It may not be easy, but what in life that's truly good ever is. Amen. Would you please stand for our closing hymn?